Can you hear me? So let's let's see. I'm here. Amy is here. Uh, Stephen, I heard your voice before. Yes, I am here, but no video. Okay, uh, Catherine, are you here? She's. She says she's in the waiting room, but I I let her in, so she's says she's here. She's on the lower right of my screen, Catherine yeah. Fuller. Yeah, she's here. Might be muted. Am I the Am I the only visitor to the committee? No, I am uh, Jim Geyser. Okay. I am as well. I, I also Eric Perlman and Janelle Piotr are visitors. Okay. Uh, I am as well. Okay. Who I is am as well. Ingrid Heckel. Okay. Right, and Susan Stesson Cohn. Okay. Who is Joyce's Galaxy? That's, That's Stephen me. and Joyce. Oh. Stephen Esposito. Okay. And my last name is Mage, so. Now, why is the town of Newport? Patrick <clears throat> is using the, the host Zoom. So, like, when I do the therapy dog ones, I, I show up like that for therapy dog. I do therapy dogs. All right, are we ready to start the meeting, I guess? Alana? Sorry, Len, I'm just trying to help Catherine get in the meeting. Okay, she's not in yet. Uh, let me know when she's in, please. Yeah. Good to go now? <clears throat> I'm working. Just let her get it's in. hard. Just not everybody. Can, you should try to get the video on that one. Oh. He's trying to get back in now. There's John. I see uh, Lynn, uh, Catherine. There's John. John is here now. So the only board member that we are missing is Catherine. No, she's getting on. Yeah, and she's trying to get back. And she's doing that thing that Steve is doing where they use it where he used to, he was using his phone, but it was on his computer. Can you hear me now, Alana? Yes. Yeah, I can Excellent. hear you, Catherine. Thank you there? You. Yes. Yeah, she's here. Yeah, she's trying to get back and she's doing that thing that Steve is doing where they use it where he used to, he was using his phone. Okay, Catherine, you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. <clears throat> So we can start, Alana? Yeah, I think so. OK, I Good. guess we can. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the March 10th Zoom meeting of the New Paltz Zoning Board of Appeals. I entertain a motion, if I could, please, for someone to open the meeting. It's a member of the board. So moved. I'll take a second, please. Second. Seconded by John. Thank you. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Okay, we know that Amy is here. We know that Stephen is here. We know that Catherine is here. We know that John is here and I'm here. Joe Moriello is here and Stacy is here. Okay, so we've got a full house. Um, <clears throat> first thing I'd like to talk about is the um, attendance. We just did that. Second thing I'd like to talk about the minutes of February 10th. If everybody has had a chance to review them, I found nothing that needed to be changed and anything I might have missed that someone might have found. Nothing here. Okay. So, Steve? I'm good. Okay. Entertain a motion to accept the minutes for February 19th, February 10th. I'll move. Seconded by John. All those in favor by aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Keep going. Yes for me. Yeah. 
Okay, our next meeting is going to be Wednesday, April 14th. I can be there. Please let me know if everyone else can be there. Amy? Yes, I can. Okay, John? Yes. Okay, Stephen? Yes. And Catherine? Yes. Okay, so we have a full house. Great, thank you. Okay. Comments from the public, please. But before we take any comments from the public, I would like to remind everyone that public comments are just that. If you have something that you would like to speak about in regard to an item on the agenda, it is best to speak during the public hearing time. That way it gets recorded and is a item that will be in consideration when a decision is going to be made. Okay. What do we do, raise our hands or? You no, know, you can raise your hands and you'll get called upon if you'd like to speak. Yeah. Well, I'd like to speak on the question of the variance for Trans Hudson. I just add, okay. I can't tell you you can't speak, but if you speak now, I would ask that you not speak again during the public hearing and say oh, the same oh, I'm thing. I'm sorry. This is, this, is, this is not the public hearing? No, this is a public comment time. Okay, public comment. So yes. Yeah. And, what, and the, is there a separate thing called the public hearing? Yes, that will be next. Tonight. Okay. Does anyone have anything like to speak about when regard to the public comments? Okay, and to entertain a motion to close the public comment time. I do. All those in favor by aye? Aye. 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 Okay, public comment time is closed. Yeah, now it's time for the public hearings. The first item on the agenda for public hearings is the 290 Old Kingston Road, Keith Leibolt. Mr. Leibolt, are you there? I am, how are you, sir? Okay, thank you. For the public, could you please tell them and give them a brief reason as to why you're here and what you would like to do? Um, Keith, Keith, do you wanna do that or do you want me to handle that for you? Yeah, I was gonna say, if it's okay with everyone, I'd like to uh, hand this over to Patty, who's represented me through this process and is much better spoken at these events than myself. <laughs> Can I ask one question of Alana? Do you have the affidavit that all of the uh, neighbors were notified and that the signs were correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Please proceed, Patty. Patty. Hi, my name is Patty Brooks with Brooks and Brooks Land Surveyors, and I am representing um, Keith Leibolt in this application for a uh, area variant for setback for the location of a shed within of the rear yard setback. Um, the applicant has placed a shed in his backyard um, unknowingly of the 50 foot required rear yard setback. Um, we are proposing that he will relocate that shed so that it will meet the 20 foot minimum side yard setback. But because of the topography on the site, we are requesting a 30 foot rear yard setback to be able to place the shed 20 feet from the boundary line. Um, do you want me to go through the variance test at this point or wait for public comment first? Um, I'm not exactly sure how this board would prefer to. Uh, Handle it. Well, the more you put on the table now, that may answer people's questions with regard to them making comments. So perhaps to hear from you would be best. Great. Thank you. Um, so again, we are aware that the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals must um, weigh the factors, the five factors, and the applicant must show that the benefit uh, that he would stand to receive from the variance would outweigh any burden to the health, safety, and welfare that may be suffered by the community. Uh, the first item is whether an undesirable change would be produced in the character of the neighborhood or a detriment to nearby properties. Um, we're stating that the shed provides a, a safe enclosed area to store yard equipment, furniture, and toys. It is not visible from any of the neighboring homes. It is not visible from Old Kingston Road, and it does not create an undesirable change to the neighborhood. Um, whether the benefits sought by the applicant could be achieved by some other feasible method. 
um, we're stating that due to the topography of the property and the location of the existing septic system, that it's not feasible to relocate the shed to another location that's sense of ground disturbance and regrading of the property. Um, whether the requested area variance is substantial. Um, basically, I'm saying that although the face of the, of the request, a 30 foot area variance appears to be substantial, um, the rear yard setback for accessory structures is actually the same as the setback for a dwelling, whereas in most communities, they have separate setbacks for accessory structures. So the impact of the size and the height of a shed is obviously significantly less than of a principal dwelling such as a house. Uh, the determination of the distance for the setback was based on the location of where the relatively flat ground is, as is shown on the survey topo map, um, before the topography starts to steeply go up the hill. We also had submitted photographs showing the location of trees that would have to be removed in order to relocate the shed to the 50 foot setback. We're saying that the granting of the variance would not have an in adverse impact on the neighborhood as again, it is not visible from any neighboring properties and it's totally surrounded by wood and whether the alleged difficulty is self-created, and we do acknowledge that the difficulty was self-created as the applicant placed the shed without first obtaining a building permit. Um, the area variance should have been requested prior to that construction, and the applicant um, has since attempted to file an application and paid a fine. Um, however, the topography of the site was not self-created and is the reason for the practical difficulty and the inability to meet the rear yard setback. And for these reasons, we would ask the planning board to please consider um, this area variance of constructing a shed within a rear yard setback. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a comment with regard to 290 Old Kingston Road? I also didn't receive anything in writing from the pu from the public about it. Just letting you know. Thank you, Alana. Okay, I entertain a motion to close the public hearing for 290 Old Kingston Road. I move. First by John, seconded by. All right, second. Second by Amy. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, at this point in time, the public hearing is closed. The second public hearing we have is for an area variance for 12 North Putt Corners Road. Um, the applicant is Trans Management LLC. I entertain a motion to open that public hearing. Would please. I move. And oh, second. I second. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Second by all those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Okay. Public hearing is now open for 12 North Butt Corners, Corners Road. I would ask if the applicant would give a brief overview that the public can hear as to what you're asking for. Uh, I believe our attorney will be here in about five or 10 seconds. That's okay, we'll wait for her. <clears throat> While we're waiting, may I um, make a comment, Lynn? Uh, no, I would prefer that you wait in any comment that you have to Trans Hudson till after the attorney has spoken. I have an interesting note uh, that has nothing to do with Trans Hudson, but it's a little bit amusing. Um, we are on a public hearing specifically dealing with Trans Hudson, Trans Hudson now. Okay. okay. I was just thinking about the last time I was before the ZBA board. It was like 42 years ago.
I apologize. Kathy is a very okay. good land use lawyer. Okay. She's coming That's in next. Right. Okay, good. Kathy is with us, Len. Hello. Hi. Yes, good evening. Doing double duty tonight. I apologize for being a little late. That's all right. Okay. Um, so, sorry, Kathy Zalantis from Silverberg Zalantis LLC. I represent the applicants, BFB New Pulse LLC and Trans Hudson Management Corp. You should have before you our January 26, 2021 letter with attachments. Um, and we're before this board, we're seeking three variances, but two are overlap and are identical. So we're seeking a variance from 140.22.2C7, which requires a minimum building height of two occupiable stories. And also from 140.22.2D3A and C, which requires buildings to have at least two occupiable stories and prohibits drive-throughs for food establishments. I just wanna take one step back before going forward. With respect to 140.22.2C, um, the proposed plan complies with eight of the nine requirements. The only thing that we're requesting is permission to do one, four, one story buildings instead of four, two story buildings. With respect to 140-22.2D, there's 32 applicable standards, 32. We, uh, the proposed plan complies with 30 of them. So it's a little confusing when I hear comments that my clients are trying to get away with something by coming before this board. First, it is their right, like every other applicant and every other property owner to seek variances from this board. Second, my clients had a fully zoning compliant site plan that they started the process back in 2013. They obtained a negative declaration under SECRA in 2017. They made extensive revisions to that plan. We got the plan to a place that the planning board was very pleased with the plan and the property was rezoned. So despite coming so far with that other plan, my clients went back to the drawing board and attempted and met with their design team and attempted to come up with a plan that, that meets the vast majority of the requirements of the new zoning. So instead of a large CVS building and a second building, they created four smaller buildings with a street facing facade that has that village feel that's in compliance with the intent of the new zoning. The plan that is before you that will be the subject of site plan review, again, complies with 30 of the 32 applicable requirements. We cannot proceed with site plan review until we get variances from this board. So before I get into the standard that this board must apply, I just want to first address some legal issues. Um, there was a question at the last meeting from one of the board members as to whether this board has authority to grant variances from design standards under 140.22.2D. So under the zoning code at 140.44D1 and town law, this board has authority to grant variances from any provision of the zoning code. So whether you call it an I could read you that provision itself. It says this board has authority to vary or modify the application of any regulation or provision of this chapter relating to the use, construction, or alteration of buildings or structures or the use of land. So it's immaterial whether the regulation is called a bulk or area variance or a design standard. They're all regulations in the zoning code. And as such, this board has authority to grant a variance from those regulations. Another issue that was raised was whether the request for um, a variance from the drive-through prohibition was a use variance or an area variance. And um, here the proposed food establishment will remain a food establishment with a drive-through and without a drive-through. 
there's no change to the essential use of the property. And therefore, according to case law, um, this, this is an area variance, not a use variance. And I provided the case of Mobile Oil Co Corporation v. Village of Mamaroneck. Um, and that case is directly on point. There, the property at issue was in the C1 commercial zone and it prohibited canopies adjacent from, it, it allowed gas stations, but prohibited gas stations with canopies that were near a residential zone. So if this particular property was next to a residential zone, you could have a gas station, but you couldn't have a gas station with a canopy. Here, just like in mobile oil, you could have a food establishment, but you can't have a food establishment with a drive-thru. So um, actually the case was, um, so in reversing the zoning board's determination that it was a use variance, the court said that it was not a use variance. The court said it was an area variance. And the court said the variance sought by petitioner was an area variance, not a use variance, since the petitioner was not seeking to change the essential use of the property. The court relied on the Court of Appeals case, which is the highest court, and another case out of the second department that was affirmed by the Court of Appeals. And this is, I think, very um, instructive of the issue. So the court ruled that the canopy is only a physical and dimensional characteristic in this respect. The essential use of the property will remain as a gas station, even with the erection of the canopy. And that's the same here. The drive-through is just a physical or um, a physical or dimensional characteristic of the property. The use is the same. The use is going to be a, a food establishment with or without the drive-through. So what you have before you is a request for an variance, an area variance, not a use variance. And I also provided a 2012 case and a 2016 case that applied that same principle that if you're not seeking to change the essential use of the property, and again, that's the quotes from the courts, this is an area variance, not a use variance. Another issue that came up was our submission of what we called a concept plan, which may have been a, a, a misnomer of sorts, because if you actually look at the concept plan, it's a very, very detailed plan. It's just not a fully engineered plan that shows utilities, um, landscaping that you would need to do for site plan review, which we intend to fully do in the context of the if we get the variances from this board. But um, the, the plan is certainly detailed enough for this board to grant variances on. Um, what my clients would be willing to do and would consent to this is that if this board wanted to make it a condition of any granting of variances to require that we obtain all required approvals, including site plan approval. We would also consent to a condition that the site plan that's submitted to the planning board be substantially similar to the plan that's reviewed by this board so that you can be sure that we're not gonna seek some other kind of plan, you know, like back to the two-story plan or the two, the two building plan. We're gonna seek a plan that's the same, that has the same four buildings that you're reviewing, um, you know, subject to any additional changes that the planning board may require in the context of the site plan review. Those are certainly conditions that are reasonable and my clients would be fine with those um, conditions. There was also some legally irrelevant comments that were made by some of, some of the comments that I heard. Um, some comments kept focusing on the intent that went into the gateway zone. Um, that's legally irrelevant in the context of whether this board should grant or deny variances. The same standard, the balancing test that this board always requires is what you have to apply, whether the zoning was adopted five minutes ago or 30 years ago. And it's the same standard whether, you know, the zoning was adopted after five minutes of review or after months and months and months and months of study and review. It doesn't matter. It's the same standard that has to be applied. Um, I also heard comments about whether they'll, there will be uh, municipal water and sewer on the property. Again, we've heard informally from the village that it was something that 
will be considered, but of course that will be something that will be formally requested of the town if we proceed with the site plan review process and that will be discussed and a condition of any site plan review process. So after addressing the legally irrelevant comments, I just wanna focus this board on the actual standard before this board. And again, this is probably the first and only variance that this board has ever had to consider and perhaps in the entire state that any zoning board have had had to consider that the applicant is requesting to do less density and a lower height than permitted by the zoning code. Usually you have the exact opposite that somebody is requesting to do a higher height than required by the zoning code. Um, and in granting a variance from the newly enacted MSMU's provision, it's no different from granting a variance from any other zoning regulation in the town. And this board must still apply the requisite area variance balancing tests. So the first factor is whether there will be an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. There will be no undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. Not having two stories is actually consistent with the character of the neighborhood. The character of the neighborhood are one story, freestanding one story buildings. And we provided evidence of that. We, in our 126 letter attached as exhibit A, we provided a Google map and pictures of nearby shopping centers and other commercial retail establishments. And with the exception of one building, one, the remaining 14 freestanding buildings are all one story buildings. Also, there's a McDonald's and a Burger King in very close proximity that both have drive-throughs. So the character of the neighborhood are food establishments with drive-throughs and one story commercial slash retail buildings. There is no other feasible method. Um, it's not financially viable to construct a second story above the retail commercial space, especially when the applicant, like in this case, is providing to do municipal uh, uses that are non-revenue producing. So there's a cost to building the trail, municipal restrooms, municipal parking. We cannot and my client is going to speak to this. He's been in the business for many years and he's going to expand on this, but we also provided an, a letter from an expert in the field attached as exhibit B to our submission about the, that it's just not feasible to construct a second story. And it's not feasible in, in this era, especially in the age of COVID, to get a tenant for a food establishment uh, use that was willing to rent that space without a drive through All food establishment uh, tenants right now are requiring drive throughs um, The variances can hardly be characterized as substantial and the result would be significantly less density and height than allowed. We're seeking to do less, not more, but in any event, um, courts have ruled, and we provided the case law on this, that when the variance is consistent with the character of the neighborhood, as these variances being requested are, the fact that it's substantial is really immaterial because we're conforming to what the existing neighborhood already has. The impacts on the physical and environmental conditions. So I would argue this is the opposite of an adverse impact on physical and environmental conditions. Again, we're seeking to do significantly less density than allowed by the code. As for the drive-through, the MSMU zone doesn't prohibit drive-throughs. It just prohibits um, drive-throughs. It allows drive-throughs for other types of uses. It just prohibits it with food establishment. And I heard some of the comments, well, there could be more traffic from food establishment. You know, traffic impacts are going, you know, and there wasn't any support for that comment, by the way, it was just a speculative comment about traffic. Traffic is gonna be studied in the context of the site plan review. We're gonna to have to address all traffic impacts. And if it turns out that the impact from the food establishment use is too great, you know, we won't get site plan approval, but that's something that's gonna be studied and just saying, making a claim with no support that there's gonna be greater impacts, that shouldn't be something that this board considers. And 
unlike probably every other development that comes before this board, this development will result in additional municipal space. There's going to be a benefit to the community through the creation of the trail, the parking spaces, and the public restrooms. And this, those uses will benefit the entire community. Um, also in accordance with the new zone, this is a mixed use development, but it's the uh, very unique mixed use development of mixing retail commercial space with municipal uses. And how many developments can you say that about? Um, and again, the village informally indicated that it's willing to extend the municipal water and sewer to the site. Um, and we will make a formal submission to the town board to pursue that, but without the variances, there is no project that can go forward. So we need this first step in the process before we can go forward with additional review by the planning board and any additional approvals that may be required. Finally, this is not a self-created hardship. Uh, the clients, my client's property was rezoned after years and years of pursuing a zoning compliant plan before the planning board. Um, and the zoning requirements with respect to height and drive through are just not practical for these types of commercial retail uses, especially in this climate. But even as you know, even if the difficulty is self-created, that is not a basis to deny an area variance. So it's clear that if this board were to apply the actual applicable standards for granting area variances, the area variances in this case must be granted. Um, the applicants have proven their entitlement to the area variances. So I am requesting that this board consider granting the area variances. I just want to um, turn over the discussion to my client, Ari Freilich, who will further address the issues of feasibility of pursuing the zoning compliant plan. Before you Thank do, you. Could, I, could I just ask Lee Bell to, if you would take your hand down because I'm unable to see all the thumbnails on one page until your, your hand signal is down. Would you do that, please? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Freilich, if you'd like to speak. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I'm called upon to express some opinions about real estate and financial matters that are pertinent to our New Paltz project. So I think I should provide some relevant background information about myself something uh, I don't like talking about myself, but I think it's pertinent in this conversation. I think what I have to say will enable you to better uh, understand the significance of my statement. Um, if you don't mind, there's somebody who's making background noise with, um, who needs to mute their, uh, thank you. Um, I was a practicing real estate lawyer in New York for 12 years. I left the practice of law in 99 for 31 continuous years. I've been in the real estate business engaged in developing and managing retail office and residential properties. Um, I own or, or have owned and operate both suburban and urban retail throughout those 31 years. In the metropolitan area, I did so in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and New Jersey. I also did so in Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Arizona. In New York State, I'm active in nearby Modena in Ulster County, in Bethel and Sullivan County, and in Greenwood Lake in Fort Montgomery in Orange County. The, my current projects include multiple retail projects in Arizona and in Ulster and Orange. I'm also building at this time a 700 unit uh, apartment complex with a significant retail component in Jersey City. Finally, for eight continuous years, until I retired a few years ago, I was a professor at NYU's graduate business school teaching second year MBAs, a course in real estate investment and finance in which I was able to pass on 
to many hundreds of students some of what I have learned over the years about finance, construction, and real estate. That's my background. Um, I live in the city and I have a home in Clinton Corners um, where I've lived continuously for the last 12 months. Uh, uh, does anybody have any questions about my background? Allow me to give you a brief uh, history of the project from my perspective. This project was originally conceived as a 16,000 foot shopping center anchored by a CVS with which we had a signed lease. When we came before the planning board, a number of residents stepped forward and expressed opposition to the idea of a strip center. Even though it was permitted use and complied with zoning, they objected to the introduction of a CVS in the town, arguing that it wasn't New Paltz. Some went so far as to say it was immoral for us to develop the land for any use whatsoever, and that we should rather contribute the land to the town. Anyway, in an effort to cooperate with the town's officials to produce a result that would work for almost everyone, we began meeting with a planning board committee selected by Adele Ruger. Subsequently, the city manager and the village's mayor joined us. We created a whole new plan. We call it the Open Shopping Center. It's a village green, four small buildings, 2,500 feet, 3,000 feet, 3,300 feet, one for 7,000 feet. These were standalone buildings with space between them, a country fence up front, lots of grass and lots of landscaping and trees. Our concept and design received excellent reviews from most of the planning board. We thought it was pretty terrific and a nice introduction to New Paltz for anyone driving into town. During this process, the bike trail board initially supervised that what was really planned by North Putt Road was dangerous and a bad idea. And that would be great if we could donate to help create a better and safer bike trail. We agreed to donate the land and to build and landscape the trail as part of our plan. Then we received encouragement from the mayor that the village would possibly be willing to allow us to connect to town water and sewer. In response, we agreed that if we were allowed to so connect, we would repurpose a no longer necessary septic field to be a parking lot and public bathroom for bikers. It was right about this time, as we were beginning to believe that we could satisfy all reasonable requests and still have a viable project, the town adopted two zoning changes that would be the death knell for our project a mandatory occupiable second floor in each building and no drive-through for food. So why a death knell? Sounds like a strong characterization. Well, this project's a costly one to build. In order to satisfy the planning board and members of the community, we've designed a considerable amount of beauty into the buildings and the site to meet local aesthetic desires. We also have to build in the cost of the trail, the parking lot, the public bathroom. It shouldn't surprise anyone that after all the nation has been through in recent years, a retail shakeout resulting from internet sales and the pandemic, it is and will be for a long time a tenant dominated market. And banks, no big risk takers, are understandably skittish about lending to a project that doesn't have credit worthy tenants. Tenants with financial strength are a necessary part of any project. Credit tenants have very specific requirements. They want a standalone building. They want brand identification. They will not rent the ground floor in a small two-story building except in an urban setting. A project, I'll say it another way, a project which includes a second floor will not rent except to tenants of financial quality and rent paying ability 
that is insufficient to permit the project to be built or to produce a profit. As someone with what I would call a significant amount of relevant experience, I say this, and in her letter to this board, Shannon Older, a respected and leading authority on the retail market in this very region, says the same. Consider for a moment the complexities of producing a town center project consisting of multiple small buildings, each having a second floor. There is no way the building department will not require two means of egress from the second floor. That means two staircases and access hallways which eat up valuable ground floor space. What about handicapped access? Wouldn't there have to be an elevator? Do we have to rent the upstairs to a tenant that specifically requires a 3,000 foot space? Well, not if you can divide it, but think about it. The second floor in a small building cannot be divided to serve two tenants without creating more hallways upstairs to provide tenant access to two staircases and the elevator. All in a 3,000 foot building? I don't think so. Finally, as regards the drive-through for retail, our site for food use, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Our site is the perfect one at which people entering or leaving New Paltz can pick up some food, some coffee or the like to bring home or to work or for the ride. It is also perfect for the many bicyclists that New, Hope, New Paltz hopes to attract. We do not seek permission to fill our site with fast food, to become a throughway pit stop, as some have suggested. We have requested a variance that would permit a single, a single food user. And that is because we believe that in the world in which we now live and, and will live for some time, a food user will ensure the financial viability of the project. And today and for the foreseeable future, as any of you who read the Times or the Wall Street Journal know, um, virtually every quick service food user in the nation will only sign a lease with a drive through facility. So this is how I see it. We've made enormous progress to produce a building, a beautiful concept. We've complied with a long list of requirements. We cannot satisfy the two that are on discussion in this proceeding and still have a project that will get off the ground, never mind succeed. Given some latitude by this board, we will provide meaningful benefits to New Paltz and the region by making a better and safer bike trail, a useful amenity in the form of parking and bathroom for visitors, and we will create a project that will be a beautiful introduction product. After all the time and effort that has been expended by so many since 2013, we would like to get back to the table with the planning board to make this project a success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freelich. Okay, um, one note that I should make a decision on this will not be made this evening. This will need to go to the county for planning review for county impact. So just to let everyone know that as we progress. Okay, I open the floor now for comments from the public. I would ask that you please state your name and where you live. This is, I'm Janelle Piotter. And I live in New Paltz, and I'm a volunteer um, volunteer coordinator for uh, New Paltz Climate Smart Task Force. Uh, I'm speaking tonight to urge the ZBA to vote against the proposal by Trans Hudson that would require a zoning variance, allowing a drive-through window for a restaurant to be built on the property on the corner of North Putt Corners and 299. 
I could talk at length about the town's pledge and certification as a climate smart community whose main goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and how a drive through increases them. But I would like to focus the question right now as to the need for a drive through. A recent article in Forbes magazine titled Why Curbside Pickup is Here to Stay Even After the pandemic ends, which is dated uh, September 22nd, 2020, talked at length about why curbside pickup is outpacing drive-through. The article made a strong case for all the reasons that customers actually prefer uh, curbside pickup. People can order ahead, don't have to wait in line, and people perceive that their food will be hotter and fresher. Why would we allow a variance that will increase idling and emissions when there is a perfectly good and maybe even preferable alternative? Furthermore, in researching this issue, I discovered an NPR piece titled, Why U.S. Cities Are Banning New Fast Food drive throughs which is dated October 10th, 2019, that some U.S. cities are even banning fast food uh, new fast food restaurant, or excuse me, uh, drive through Minneapolis uh, passed an ordinance uh, banning the construction of new drive through windows and similar legislation restricting or banning drive through windows has also passed in Missouri, California, and close to us, New Jersey. Most bans focus on curbside emissions, reducing litter, improving pedestrian safety, and enhancing walkability. Why would we not want the same for new pulse? While some people have been extra, uh, have taken extra measures of safety with takeout food for some time due to COVID-19, this pandemic is shifting and will eventually be in our rear view mirror. Unfortunately, once you grant a variance for a drive-through, we will be stuck with it forever and for any and all buildings on the property, regardless of current or future owners. The February 10th edition of the New Paltz Times, I noticed that there was a featured story about the plans that McGillicuddy's is proposing. And at his presentation to the planning board, Keenan, the owner stated, I see, quote, I see the future of the restaurant business being focused on outdoor dining, unquote. The location of this proposed development by Trans Hudson is immediately adjacent to the Empire State Trail. This would seem an ideal location for outdoor dining, which is not really compatible with a drive through. Would you want to sit at a picnic table next to a long line of idling vehicles? I urge you to vote against granting this variance and stay true to the intent of the gateway district zoning. Granting this variance is unnecessary as the overwhelming majority of restaurants in New Paltz are successful businesses and have no drive-through windows. Granting this variance would be in conflict with the board's pledge and the climate smart community's goals and would not benefit the residents of New Paltz. I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak on this? Yes. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Judy Mage. <clears throat> I came um, to New Paltz uh, way back uh, about 40 years ago. And <clears throat> my previous uh, relationship to the board of uh, that your board was when I was buying a house here and uh, everything worked out very nicely. But since then, I've had no occasion to come to a board meeting, but I feel very strongly about this, <clears throat> about this matter right now. And I'm speaking in opposition to Trans Hudson being uh, granted the variance regarding the second story. Uh, I wasn't aware that there were four separate buildings being considered, and I'm not sure that that's the way it would end up. But in any event, whether it's four second stories or one second story or two second stories, depending on the number of buildings, in any case, having those second stories as the provision for housing is 
extremely important if this project is to have any value to the citizens of New Paltz. The, uh, the Freeman just had a recent article on a tremendous lack of for affordable housing throughout the county. And New Paltz is certainly no exception to that. We have people who work in New Paltz who have to commute long, long distances because they cannot possibly find affordable housing. Having one or two or three or four housing units on the second floor, <clears throat> uh, if there's a variance needed, it could be a variance that doesn't require an elevator, for example. But, you know, so that handicapped access might not be absolutely required. But there's so much need for affordable housing and having housing for people who do not have autos so that these people could get to commercial developments, could get to ShopRite, could get around the corner, uh, would be a trem tremendous boon. Already, the, the establishment of commercial development on that corner is going to, and especially with the cutting of the trees that form a, a barrier to some of the pollution that is uh, already, the, has been continually growing over the years from the cars that are lined up uh, to have that the to have the kind of well I'm, I'm not going to repeat what Janelle just spoke of but that is certainly one more thing that is going to create very very bad air pollution and so at least there would be something good for the community that would come out of having a second story and having housing for people. Uh, the, uh, basically we're talking about residential units for local employees. And that is what there's tremendous lack of. The, um, there's also the question of adding, adding a lot more traffic coming off the throughway because if we had housing there for local employees, we wouldn't be adding to the traffic jams off the throughway. People would be, can you hear me? It says your internet connection is unstable. I can I hear you. Can you hear can me? Can hear you fine. Yes, no? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. You're muted now. You have to unmute yourself, Judy. I'm clicking on. Now, now there you we, go. Now we hear you. Now we're good. Okay. It okay, says. Okay, let's see if you could please sum it up so we can get on. I'm going to start sum it up. Yeah. Okay. We need mixed development, and having a second story for residential use would provide the kind of mixed development that has always been the, the goal of the, I live on Huguenot Street, around the corner from me is it going to be a four, well, it's already a four story building that there was a good push to have a fourth story. The builder had to agree to have that fourth story so that there could be uh, an avoidance of more sprawl. So what we don't need is sprawl. So this would at least eliminate some of the demand for housing, even if it's not a lot, but every little bit helps. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your time. Well, okay. Does anyone else wish to speak, yes. please? Yes. Yes, I'd like to speak. Lee Bell. I live in New Paltz on 3 Julia Avenue, and I'd like to read a letter from my colleague, Rose Rodnitsky, who couldn't be here for this meeting. Um, okay. Dear members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, as you're well aware, I'm making your determination regarding the variances sought by Trans Hudson. You will need to consider whether granting them would have a negative impact on the character and conditions of the adjoining district. I will briefly describe several concerns likely negative impacts. <clears throat> First, the applicant has argued that because a bank drive through is already allowed, a restaurant drive through should now be permitted. This is a false comparison. 
A fast food drive through especially one located right off the throughway, will generate much higher traffic volume. This additional traffic impact has not been measured, but earlier projections from the applicant's consultants anticipated that westbound weights at the Puck Corners 299 intersection would more than double once the project was completed. Further, the additional fast food drive through traffic would also cross two-way bike and pedestrian traffic on the Empire State Trail in order to enter Trans Hudson site via a driveway from 299. In a 2019 letter to the planning board, the New Paltz Bike Pedestrian Committee objected to this dangerous ingress off of 299, an objection that carries even more weight given the subsequent addition of the fast food drive-through. Your approving this variance would exacerbate already bad traffic circumstances at the site and will result in significant negative impact on the district. Finally, and considering the request for the second story variance, it is critical that the board consider the potential impact on the entire Gateway District, only a fraction of which has already been built. Allowing the applicant to sidestep the community's clear preference for a district that is mixed use, bike and pedestrian friendly and not sprawl only the applicant operating through a narrow sprawl oriented frame stands to gain from having the second story requirement removed. The community on the other hand would lose the opportunity for what could otherwise be a keystone of a district that reflects popular values for smart planning. While the applicant has suggested a less dense project would be doing the community a favor, in this case, the opposite is actually true. Here, a deficient zoning non-compliance site plan would be a detriment to nearby properties and a loss for the Gateway District and for the town. There is no shortage of commercially viable uses for two-story buildings on the site that would come without the negative impacts that would ensue from the current variance-dependent proposal before you. Thank you for your consideration. This is Dr. Rose Rednitsky from New Paltz. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Ingrid? Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, Chair Loza and members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, my name is Ingrid Heckel. I'm chair of the Town of New Paltz Environmental Conservation Board. And uh, these comments are on behalf of the nine members of our board. We recommend denial of the variances sought by BFB, New Paltz LLC, and Trans Hudson Management Corp to allow a drive through restaurant and waive the second story building requirement at North Putt Corners, 12 North, North Putt Corners Road. Granting these variances would have clear negative impacts on the neighborhood in terms of traffic generation and emissions from vehicle idling and set a precedent undermining the goal of the compact mixed use development in the Main Street mixed use or MSMU district. The comprehensive plan amendment states as objectives for the MSMU district to knit together the village and the town and transition away from auto-oriented strip commercial development and extend the village's walkable mixed-use Main Street character into the town as properties are improved and redeveloped over time. drive through restaurants are a core element of auto-oriented strip development and allowing a drive through restaurant would also generate increased traffic through the Trans Hudson property and increased emissions and air pollution from vehicle idling. The applicants June 29th, 2020 cover letter to the planning board stated, uh, quote, this location with its proximity to the throughway exit mandates a food and beverage use, unquote. This indicates that the applicant fully intends to draw visitors from the throughway uh, to, draw to the drive through restaurant, which could create a de facto rest stop at the busiest intersection in New Paltz. The original environmental review process did not consider the potential traffic impacts of a drive-through restaurant. Um, they looked at a drive-through pharmacy, which is quite different. Traffic concerns at this intersection have only increased with the pending relocation of fire and emergency services to North Putt Corners Road and construction of the Empire State Trail. Um, secondly, the, the second story building requirement in the MSU MU district is central to the vision for Main Street character and compact mixed use development. And I think um, we couldn't put it better than the town board did in their 
resolution denying this requested waiver back in December. <clears throat> Do you want to keep listening? The MSMU requires density of people in a single location in order to concentrate development and fulfill the goals of smart growth. The comprehensive plan amendment for the Route 299 Gateway Corridor and the stated purpose section of the MSMU regulations set forth in the zoning law clearly indicate that concentrated development is a goal for the town. Concentrating development in certain areas eliminates vehicle trips, allows for shared parking, which lessens the environmental impact and permits efficient design, such as shared entrances and egresses. The loss of these potential residents or additional customers will have a negative effect on the district." Unquote. Uh, so in summary, we urge you to uphold the intent of the new MSMU zoning requirements and deny these variances. And we thank you for your consideration of these comments. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at this public hearing time? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, my name is Zach Bialecki. I'm a resident of New Paltz and I'm speaking on, my, on behalf of myself and Ariana Basco. Um, dear members of the zoning, zoning Board of Appeals, I'm writing to express my concerns regarding the Trans Hudson request for three area variances. Um, first, the request for the area variance for the drive-through, um, despite the, the uh, arguments of the um, developer's lawyer, I, I believe should be considered a use variance. Um, a, dr <laughs> a drive through restaurant is significantly different than a uh, canopy over a uh, gas station and the town has determined that this type of use is not allowed in this zone for good reasons. Um, secondly, the traffic impact study for this project is outdated and also no longer relevant. So um, it was conducted for a drive through pharmacy as other public comments have stated, not for a drive through fast food restaurant. Um, Related to this, the uh, 2017 seeker ne negative declaration is also outdated and no longer relevant. The Empire State Trail was not considered in that process as it did not exist. And being that the trail is adjacent to the property, I urge you to consider your responsibility to ensure public safety. Um, the town board has passed a resolution to deny the applicants requested variances for the drive through and exemption from the two-story requirement. To grant the applica applicant's request would go against the clearly stated standards for future development that has been supported by the broader community. Uh, next, the applicants claim that there would be no local tenants interested in the second story flies in the face of the fact that a number of new businesses have opened and are slated to open in New Paltz. There's been an influx of entrepreneurs and business owners who are excited to um, breathe new life into New Paltz and to claim otherwise um, seems unbelievable. Uh, finally, the applicants claim that a drive-through is the only way to have a viable business in New Paltz is also uh, seems like a stretch. We have, as other people noted, numerous restaurants and eateries in our community that are thriving with the standard pickup model and do not have drive through windows. In fact, McDonald's and Burger King are the only two. Um, most have stayed open through the pandemic and with the pandemic easing and New York State uh, opening up again, this will become even less relevant. Um, so in summary, to grant these variances to this applicant uh, is to set a precedent that goes against the goals of the community in regards to development. We strongly urge that the ZBA deny all three requests. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else had their hand up? I do. My name's yes. Eric. I'm a homeowner resident of New Paltz. I've been asked to read a letter to the ZBA from Kitty Brown. Um, 
she couldn't be here for personal reasons. Uh, she writes, Dear Chair Lozen, members of the ZBA, the Ulster County Design Manual, September 2017, design guidelines, quote, establish a shared idea of how new growth fits in with existing and desired appearance and character of the community, end quote. New Paltz Gateway Zone adopted, by, adopted many of these practices after years of study, public hearings, and revision. Mixed use zoning is a solution to environmentally sound growth, and though not required, makes desperately needed affordable housing possible. Uh, see excerpts below. And she said she would email this letter and the charts below to the committee. Bloomberg and Freilich B and E is an experienced commercial landlord and developer with projects throughout the nation and city and much more complex zoning than the New Paltz Gateway Zone. Granting the variances requested by B and E would be a huge setback for any town trying to maximize density and the limited acreage available for development. As the lawyer for the town demonstrated in the resolution that was adopted in December 2020, there is no hardship in complying with this zoning. And in fact, there are many opportunities. New Paltz needs the following businesses. New Paltz, uh, an audiologist, audio, audio recording studio, child daycare, clothing store, Old Navy is usually on the second floor at malls, county satellite offices, department store, electric shuttle bus visitor center to Minnewaska, film and TV studio space, editing dailies. The Hudson Valley is a major film and TV hub, high-end grocery store, MRI, CT scan, x-ray, parking garage, first floor, retail, second floor. Gateway zoning even permits a third story. Pet grooming, supply, Petco, shoe store. Year-round indoor recreation, bowling alley and roller rink. This kind of use would be appropriate for one story and has huge community support. I recently asked the New Paltz Facebook page if people would go to a bowling alley or a roller skate rink. 257 quote liked the post, 139 commented yes, exclamation, and one said no. Other suggestions were an arcade, a mini golf, and laser tag, and this is it. And this isn't even counting the six thousand eight hundred and seven students at the college. Um, I will summarize the three addendums that she posted here: a uh, definition of, of crossroads, uh, complete a new center. Crossroads are places that already have some of the ingredients. All, all of the of members the do have this, these sheets. And I, I would ask, is there any, uh, let me just ask, are any of the members that do not have this letter from Katie Brown? Okay, so all okay. of these charts, the, the beef of the letter you read to us and the rest are charts that, um, will be rather confusing. I don't know how you're going to display those with regard to um, proceeding through this letter. I will just conclude. Basically, okay. the chart summarized the advantage of um, preferred development um, and addresses advantages versus disadvantages of typical current practice versus smart growth alternatives. And she concludes by saying, and you have those before you, uh, please deny these variances so Trans Hudson can help New Paltz grow the businesses we need. Thank you, Kitty Brown. Okay, thank you. Anyone else that would wish to speak? May I just briefly respond? You may. So I've heard the comments tonight and you are being asked to consider items that are not relevant to deny an area variance. The, the claims about traffic, first of all, they're unsupported. Um, my clients obtained a negative declaration based on a much larger, more intensive proposed use and traffic 
will be studied going forward um, as part of this the site plan review. Um, and and there'd be a determination as to whether the traffic is appropriate, if there's any change. But currently the the neg deck in place was for a much larger, more intensive use. And all you've heard today was unsupported claims about traffic. Um, the vision of the town, it's completely irrelevant. Um, that's not one of the basis to deny an area of variance. The vision of the town is always set forth in the zoning regulations, but this board has authority to grant relief from that those regulations. The waiver requirements that the town board considered, the standards there are much different than the standards for granting a variance. And hardship, which was one of the factors, is not a factor to grant um, an area variance. Um, it's not my opinion whether something is a use or area variance that I was citing case law by the appellate division that relied on the highest court. And it's, it's that law that establishes that the drive-through request for a variance is an area variance because the essential character of the restaurant is staying. And it's just well-settled law at this point. It's not an opinion that I'm giving, it's the law. Um, and if this court were to determine that it's a use variance, I think that that determination would be subject to being overturned. Um, the trail, the comments about the trail next to the property, we're proposing the trail run through the property. As Mr. Freilich said, we are proposing to donate, my clients are proposing to donate that land to the town so the trail can run through the property. Um, and then claims about developing a bowling alley and skating rink and residential, that's not this proposal. You can't ask an applicant to develop something there. You have to consider the benefit to the applicant, right? There's no benefit to, to my client as weight to ben uh, you're, you're considering the benefit to the applicant as weight against the detriment to the community. There's no benefit to my client to developing a bowling alley and an ice skating rink. And if that's something the town wants to do, it should purchase the property from my client and develop a bowling alley and an ice skating rink but that's not the benefit that my client is seeking. So you can't hold my client to some different standard and say, because this would be great on the property, that's a basis to deny a variance. My client is also not seeking to develop residential uses. In fact, the plan, many planning board members commented that this would not be an appropriate location for residential, given the proximity to the throughway and the potential pollution that they would not wanna see residential development on this property. So, I mean, I've heard a lot of comments today, but many of them are legally irrelevant and not a basis to deny an area variance. Yes, Mr. Freilich. We, uh, we, we find ourselves um, cast in a position in which we are endeavoring to please different masters. And by that, I mean, as, as I said, when we originally began, we were perfectly entitled to build a standard Main Street strip center. Um, we had a signed lease with CBS. If anybody doesn't think we could fill up a small strip center with that as an anchor, they're sorely mistaken. But we've, we've worked diligently with a dedicated and talented group of people on the planning board who give us, believe me, uh, ice, ice in the winter or whatever, whatever the expression is to say, they give us very little. Um, but we've worked with them and we've come an enormous distance and we have created a beautiful concept which was waylaid by a zoning change which at, at the, where no one at the table had a credible understanding of creating a viable site. I'm sorry, uh, I give money to various, uh, various organizations that support affordable housing and homeless benefits and things of that sort. 
But we are no, not at this point in, in our country's history, we are not at a point where we point fingers at someone and say, hey, you, you're going to take your property and you're going to make it into a subsidized housing um, project. It is not viable here. It is not viable on many levels. And, 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 and I, I don't think we go around reaching into each other's pockets. What we try and do is create the best thing that we can. We have a property that permits development. We should be allowed to develop. I'm sorry that somebody thought two stories here was a great idea and that somehow that was gonna improve the density uh, of new pulse and create environmental benefits. Uh, I could debate that one till tomorrow, but that's not today's discussion. We are not able to put starving artists on the second floor. We're not able to create that. It is not feasible. If this board wants to direct the planning board to have us create a, a, a two-story strip mall, then you know we can make that work. We tried to do something that was benefiting the town here. We tried to create something that would be pretty and people would drive in and they would say, wow, this is a town with some elegance to it. That's our, our that was our goal. We didn't do it. We didn't design in all these architectural beauties in order to um, save money. So as I tried to state as clearly as I'm able, it is not possible to take a 3000 foot building in a village square, town square concept and put people upstairs and make it work. It doesn't work. It's not feasible. And so what has been designed here in the zoning ordinance is a doomed to failure concept. Now, you can ask me whether I think that was done intentionally or not. And perhaps over coffee, I would tell you what I really think. But that's not, as, as Kathy Zelantis has said repeatedly, that's not why we're here. We want to build a beautiful project for New Paltz. We hope to make some money on it. We certainly hope to be able to build it without going bust. Um, we ask for relief from two parts of the ordinance. We're not here to build a throughway uh, pit stop. We're not going to have lines of cars streaming out. It's ridiculous. We're talking about having one place with fast food. I mean, come on. Um, and we're talking about allowing us to build a viable and attractive and appealing grouping of single story buildings. Um, Any. Anyway. I, uh, I thank you for listening. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak? Lynn, just to clarify, you mentioned earlier that the board won't be voting until the next meeting because you're awaiting a response from the county. Is that correct? That this needs to be sent to the county because of its proximity to Route 299. That is correct. Do you anticipate the public hearing remaining open until the April meeting or will you close the public hearing this evening? I believe all that have spoken today okay. have spoken that wish to speak and no one has notified me that they were unable to speak at this public hearing. So I actually see no need to continue the public hearing on to the next meeting. Joe, any recommendations on that? Yes, I was still on mute. Sorry, Len, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, from the legal perspective, and I guess I'm gonna direct some of these questions to Ms. Salantis. Um, my understanding of these entire applications is that they get to the Zoning Board of Appeals to request a variance because there is an active site plan application before the planning board. Um, I think the Zoning Board of Appeals is typically used to the idea that someone who wants to put up an eight foot fence, for instance, in their front yard goes to the building inspector, the request for a permit would have to be denied because of the way the law is written and they then seek a variance before the 
Zoning Board of Appeals. My understanding of this is that, uh, well, let me say this. There is a separate section of law with respect to site plan review that if variances are required by an applicant before the planning board for site plan review, they are entitled to come to the Zoning Board of Appeals to seek those variances and they don't have to have a denial by the local building inspector. I know in the submission by Ms. Salantis, there's repeated um, reference to site plan approval. There's been some questions about this being labeled a concept plan. Um, I did try and get some confirming information from the planning board attorney, Rick Golden, who is scheduled just unfortunately did not allow him to get back to me before this meeting. But um, for Catherine, do, is it your position that you are before the Zoning Board of Appeals pursuant to that separate section because there is a site plan application before the planning board? Yeah, there is an active site plan application before the planning board. In fact, just quite recently, my client was requested by the planning board secretary to um, um, even though the, 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 you know, there has to be a certain amount of escrow account for planning boards to replenish the escrow account because it has to be, even though that it's in, in the positive amount, you know, it was uh, to, so clearly the town still views this as an open account because they're asking open planning board uh, matter because they're asking for additional escrow funds. So yes, we have an active ac application pending before the planning board. The issue is that we cannot proceed uh, any further until we get variances from this board. And like I said earlier, perhaps referring it to a con as a concept plan was a bit of a misnomer because it is a very detailed plan, probably more detailed than the, many of the plans that come before this board. Um, but it just is not a fully engineered site plan that has all the different sheets of pages like utilities and landscaping and erosion control measures that you would need to get site plan approval. But, you know, there's a cost to doing those plans. You know, we've, and my clients don't wanna, the next step would be that if we were to get variances on the plan that you have before you that has sufficient information to grant those variances, we would then submit a full submission with all those supporting plans to the planning board and proceed with the site plan review. That's, understood and and this ultimately then depending on the determination by the board if variances are granted it will go back to the planning board and continue there um yes i also wanted to speak with rick regarding seeker and catherine i wonder if you would touch on that i keep hearing that there was a negative declaration back in 2017 but this plan is not the plan that was reviewed under Seeker, if I'm correct. How do you view the Seeker process with respect to the Zoning Board of Appeals and its review and final determination on the granting of variances? Well, the issue really before the Zoning Board of Appeals is the height. Right, and we're seeking to do one story, and one story was reviewed as with respect to Sikra and a drive through. That's the other variance. And that, that issue, there was a drive through for pharmacy, which I would say is a much more intensive use. And that, that was reviewed, but traffic itself, the, the category of traffic will certainly be continued to be reviewed as part of the planning board process. But the actual secret issues before this board are one story, right? Which is the same as the other plan, except you're talking about four smaller, less intensive buildings and, and the drive-through. And the planning board will, of course, look at this traffic, internal traffic circulation of the drive through and to ensure there's adequate pedestrian crossing of the drive through lanes. And those issues would be further addressed in the 
in the context of the site plan review. But the secret issue, you know, we were talking about uh, with the 2017 plan, you're talking about a much greater footprint than this footprint in square footage. Can I, um, can I make a comment about Seeker? Uh, um, Amy, Amy, hold on, hold on. Let her finish, please. I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. No, that okay. I was. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Go now. ahead, Amy. Uh, um, you may. The, um, I hate to get between two lawyers here on this, but my understanding of Seeker is that uh, the ZBA is not the lead agency. And so any questions relating to Seeker have to go to the lead agency. The zoning board could address them or one of the people who commented here uh, um, can address them to the lead agency. Uh, um, and so it's not something for us to consider as I understand it. We would um, uh, just look at, for instance, the question of a drive-in does it or does it not uh, um, conform to the requirements that we have for granting a variance? Uh, I have one other comment, and that is that John Gatto and I are new on the board. And in order for me to do my duty in reviewing an application in front of the board, I need to see all the current information. And I would prefer not to have uh, uh, comments relating to a traffic study that was done in 2013 or a seeker review that happened in 2017. If, uh, if somebody who wants to make a public comment or uh, um, Ari or Kathy Zalantis want to make a point using some information from an earlier application, it would be very helpful to me to see that information submitted afresh with this current request for a variance. Does that make sense, Joe? I understand what you're saying. I, it's kind of why I was just asking about the seeker review. As I say, I just, I have not had the opportunity to discuss that with um, Mr. Golden and make sure that this coordination between whatever it is that the Zoning Board of Appeals may do or not do, that we're, that the ZBA is not missing something that it should be doing or should be considering under Seeker as part of this application. I realize for site plan approval, the Planning Board is indeed the lead agency. The board, the ZBA members may recall though that in other requests for variances, you've not been able to make a final determination until the seeker process has been completed by the planning board. I honestly need to speak with Mr. Golden further about that um, and possibly Miss Zolantis, but I wanna raise the issue so we know where we are with seeker. My other question, I just wonder, um, Alana, we've not received anything from the local planning board. Am I correct? Town planning board? About about this whole thing, no. Uh, uh, the variance, app, the applications itself? Yeah, no, I haven't gotten anything. Okay, have they been, has it been referred to the planning board? Specifically? Yeah, I think I talked to Adele about it and she said that they weren't going to comment. Say okay. that again, please. I talked to Adele and she said that they weren't going to comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, back to your thank original you. question, Lynn, whether to close the public hearing. If you close it, I think the board is gonna have to make a determination, I think on the, on the variances um, relatively quickly. And there's nothing back, for instance, from the county planning board for the board to consider and to get any additional responses from the applicant if necessary. Um, I'm thinking that we should leave the public hearing open if the board is content to send everything that's been heard at the public hearing so far to the Ulster County Planning Board and await its decision, I think that there's a record before it, but it also sounds to me like Amy would like to hear 
some and see some additional information. The county planning board may or may not. Kathy, do you have any views on submission to the county planning board? And um, can I just clarify? Um, yeah. I, what I would like to see is if uh, members of the public commenting on the hearing want to discuss some decision that was made in the time before John Gatto and I joined the board, I think it's our duty to see those things, not just to say uh, the town doesn't like this, the town wanted to do something else. So uh, um, perhaps I could urge members of the public who want to comment on the public here at the public hearing, if you have um, information from the past that's still relevant, that you want the board to know about in their review, uh, um, give us another copy of it. That's that's what I was trying to say, Len. Thank you. Okay, so I entertain, um, I'll make a motion to extend the public hearing to our next meeting of April 14th. Can I ask whether the county board is going to get back to us before April 14th? Yes. You should, yeah. So moved. All those in favor by aye? Aye. aye. Motion carried. Okay. Next item on the agenda. We now move to uh, application review for uh, 290 Old Kingston Road. We've had the public hearing. Um, now I'd like commentary and discussion from the board members with regard to their feelings. Um, discussion, comments from anyone, John? Yes. <clears throat> um, this variance that's being requested is really quite substantial. Let's see, quite a you know, more than half the distance uh, that it should be. Uh, and this little movement of the shed that's being proposed uh, doesn't really address the, the uh, substantiality of, of this variance, which remains. It's, it's quite, quite considerable. And the arguments that have been made uh, for its necessity, as I follow them, have most to do with topography of the uh, of the area and a, a slope that makes it difficult to relocate, uh, giving it the proper setback. I'm looking at the topographical map and I see, I see the shed at 228 uh, contour. And if you moved it 30 feet to a proper setback, you would be at the 234 contour. It's like six feet. Uh, to me, that doesn't seem like uh, a tremendous burden in terms of relocating within uh, a setback, not needing a variance. I guess the question, thank you, John. I have a question to Mr. Leibold. Um, you have a 12, 12 by 16 shed. I believe that as John commented with regard to the slope of the land, maybe two or three yards of crushed stone underneath it, you could level that shed to pretty much any place that you needed to move it to. And the crushed stone would allow the water to flow through and the rot or homes for any animals would be far less likely. There's no perimeter plan of the leach field. So we really don't know where it goes to. Um, so, I, I'm in favor with Mr. Gatto that is this is somewhat substantial and that alternative may, ways could have been made. Um, do you have any commentary with regard to that? Um, I completely agree uh, with the crushed stone. It currently sits on roughly six inches of crushed, crushed stone. Um, I would still want to do that. My fear is while we're looking at this on paper and, and we're doing our best, if I were to say we don't need this variance and in a couple of weeks go to conduct the work 
and to a survey still need a variance because of one or two feet, um, it would result in us coming back and taking up more of the town's time. Um, I would be fine to make every effort which could be handled through building to accommodate that and this not necessarily have been needed. I just would prefer if we move forward, obviously as the applicant with the variance and I make every effort to have, like you said, use crushed stone to try to attempt to make it comply. Um, and it would be best for the shed. Of course, it would extend its life. It would keep from rodents. It would keep from rot. Um, just living here with the topography and, and knowing where that sits like, with my full apologies. Um, I'm just nervous that we'll get into it and it in fact won't, won't work out and we'll be back here in a month. I think if, if I could just interject here, I think that one of the points that perhaps um, the board is not recognizing is that when we're talking about the topography, it's not necessarily the elevation of the land in the spot where the shed is placed. It is the topography or the change in grade from the front to the rear of the shed. So the further apart the lines are, the flatter the contour of the ground is. So where the shed is right now, the um, front and the rear of the shed are both at the 228 contour. So the shed is level. Um, if we were to relocate the shed to where we would have the 50 foot setback, we would have about a four foot elevation difference between the front of the shed and the rear of the shed without doing regrading. So again, it doesn't have to do with the elevation of the ground where the shed is placed. It has to do with the steepness, you know, kind of like that of the grade of the property. So the shed is going to be horizontal. You have to cut in on one side and fill on the other side cut trees and disturb the ground to get it in there. And then the question is, how do I get in and out of the shed? Because I'm going to have to grade it well beyond um, placing it on the ground because I still have to be able to open up that door and get lawn equipment in there. And so those, those are the reasons, um, perhaps I misspoke when I was talking ab about the contour or didn't fully explain what the issue was. Now, I, I, I will just say, I, I understand that issue perfectly well. Uh, and I, I concede that it might require a bit of uh, grading work uh, to make it happen. By, hold on, just by grading work, we're talking about four feet of crushed fill. I that's, ask, he knows the dimension. Like two, One three, at a time, three. please. Put under a foundation. That's just, that's not, I just, for everyone as a builder, that is a, that's a massive lift of, of, of stone. E Amy? Uh, Keith, do you know the, uh, the location of the septic field? Uh, how close it is to the shed right now? And uh how close it is to the setbacks um but for perfect footage i'm sorry amy I, I don't um from the records i have as the house existed i bought it and renovated it i believe it is the the only flat area left on the property which is where the my playground set is is that area um and then it's a very steep drop off on all my sides that i i around it as you can see I, I don't have that information. I'm sorry. And the current, the current shed and the proposed change location, they're both tucked in behind trees, right? So they're not. I wasn't able to see them from the road, but they're not visible from the road. Is that right? That is correct. They're not visible from yeah. the road or any of my neighbors. Um, it's all. It's honestly a barely. You can see the top of it from my own patio, and that's it. Catherine, do you have any questions? I, 
did. I just wanted to clarify, Keith, you mentioned that when you get into it, it may actually be a different amount. Are you suggesting that you may need less of a variance than you're requesting in your application? Did I understand that correctly? Um, no, I don't think we would. I mean, Pat, we've surveyed the lot and I'm not trying to necessarily muddy the water by saying that. I guess, uh, no, I wouldn't need necessarily less. I guess what I meant was my intent, obviously, is to make this improvement as comply as much as I can when I'm physically moving the shed and I'm physically making these adjustments. Um, and I meant, I meant that in uh, intent uh, to respond to John's just comment. Um, this is obviously working off paper makes the most sense. And living here makes the most sense from when I, I walk this land every day. And um, I don't think I can make it much better, but obviously I, I, I would love to if I can. Stacey, Stacey, I saw your hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> Patty's saying there's a four foot elevation difference between the front and the rear. Um, we, we would not be happy with a four foot lift of cursed stone. Um, it would have to go substantially out beyond the structure in order for us to be comfortable with it just for movement purposes. So I just kind of wanted to bring that into this a little bit. Yes, that four foot lift really doesn't make sense. No. Not at all. Steve, do you have any questions? Steve, you there? It says he's still there, but he's muted. He's muted. Oh, can can you unmute him? I can ask he... him to unmute and then. Okay. He is. okay. There he is. Hi. There he is. Technology. <laughs> Steve, do you have any particular questions with regard to uh, Mr. Leibold's uh, request for a variance? No. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. I'm good. All right. Let me uh, let me get the paper clip off of here. Turn some pages. We've got high tech and low tech. Yes. Yes. Len, okay. Can I, can I, John, can I you have a question? I want to ask. Uh, I want to ask Stacy to clarify what her concerns were. Well, I mean, crushed stone is just crushed stone. So if you're just going to put put crushed stone down and level it, and put this shed on it, there's going to be movement. It's not like a, it's not a concrete foundation or a block foundation. So in, in order for that, to really be, it's, it's got to be stable. All right. So, so for him to for him to put that depth of stone under the shed, he would have to go substantially out beyond the shed, okay, to, to give that any type of, of stability. That's my concern. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. It, it sounds like there's two, two different possibilities. One is you, you make it level by adding a big pile of crushed stone, and the other is you make it level by grading the, the existing ground. Yes, I was just speaking to the stone. Okay. Yeah, but in, in regard to the stone, it just can't be a pile of stone 12 by 16. Got it. I'll make these numbers up. It's going to have to be a number, uh, maybe uh, um, 18 by 25, because the stone will have a tendency to roll down and, sl and slide. So it, it, it just a square block underneath it would not, would not work. Okay. And I, I guess that is just one other thing, last point that, that I will make, uh, I understand the board needs to move forward. Um, but the last point I would like to make is the fact that this is not going on a permanent foundation and it is not a principal structure. It, it is yes. a shed that will not, not be on a, a permanent foundation. It will be movable if at some point in time, um, you know, it, it needed to be relocated. Um, and 
we're looking again at the balance test between the benefit that the applicant will gain versus the detriment to the community and the municipality. So in this particular instance, I, I also would say that I think that the detriment that would be caused by the regrading and the disturbance of land and the removal of trees, which would be far beyond the 12 by 16 footprint, um, perhaps would really significantly out, outweigh the, the benefit that the, um, that the applicant could gain by having this variance. So I would, I would ask the board to consider that as well. Okay, at this point in time, I would ask if any of the other board members, the attorney or the building inspector have any questions. If not, we would move on to the five questions. Okay, since I heard nothing, I can assume there are no questions. Question letter A, um, please answer yes or no, if you would, either Patty or Keith, whether the undesirable change will produce in the character of the neighborhood or a detriment to nearby properties will be created by granting of this area variance. Go ahead, Patty. No. Both say no, right. Yeah. <laughs> you can take lead, Patty. <laughs> okay, thank you. Whether the benefits sought by the applicant can be achieved by some method feasible for the applicant to pursue other than the area variance? No. Whether the requested area variance is substantial? Um, it's probably 50%. So I would say I would consider, I believe that over 30% um, by ZBA standards is considered significant. So is that a yes slash no or? That would be, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, for a principal structure, no for an accessory. <laughs> okay, I understand. Whether the proposed variance will have an adverse effect or impact on the physical or environmental conditions in the neighborhood or district? No. Whether the alleged difficulty was self-created, which consideration shall be relevant to the scissoration of the Zoning Board of Appeals, but shall not necessarily preclude the granting of the variance? Yes. We acknowledge it was self-created. Okay. So at this point in time, I would ask the board if there's any discussion that they would like to um, make with regard to the uh, granting or the denial of this particular variance. If you agree or disagree with the five questions, you may speak. Um, anyone have any questions or comments? I, I will say this, that uh, I think in terms of the physical impact on the area uh, and the fact that it's uh, an accessory or a shed building uh, uh, and the fact that you might have to cut trees in order to be compliant, all these things add up uh, in its in favor. Uh, the biggest thing I have uh, not in favor of it is number one, that it was avoidable and number two, that it's, uh, you know, it's it's chipping away at at the town zoning. Uh, so, those are the things I'm weighing. Okay. I would add in favor of the shed being in the uh, the location proposed in red. That I think you still can't see it from the road, so the detriment to the town would be exceedingly minor. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. So I agree with John that there is the concern about chipping away at the zoning aspect, but you know this is a unique property in terms of its topography. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I'm struggling with. Um, I heard two sort of yeses in the response from the applicant. Um, do we make a determination between substantial, whether it's an accessory building or a primary building? Uh, I don't know that we've done that before. So these are just thoughts I had. I don't know if other board members, what their opinion is on that matter. Uh, our code doesn't distinguish between a, a principal and accessory dwelling. So we wouldn't be able to take that into account, I guess. Stacy, were you? Uh, does our code distinguish between an accessory and a principal building? 
Uh, no, the code is and does not uh, distinguish between whether a building is for setback purposes, whether a building is a primary or accessory. A building is a building. Okay, I understand. Would anyone so like to make a uh, Sorry, just one thing, Len. I didn't know if anyone had any thoughts on the concern John had about chipping away at the zoning. I have that concern as well when we're listening to any application. But I find the topography of this site to be quite unique. Um, so it would not chip away at zoning across the, the entire town. So I, I don't know if others have thoughts on that. I believe that the reason that people come to the zoning board in most cases is they have a unique situation. And um, if that was totally flat land, I believe the applicant would just simply move the shed and there would be no, um, no need for a variance, just simply correct it to where it needed to be placed. I do agree with you that constantly chipping away at the zoning doesn't make sense because that's why we have the zoning. So it is, uh, it is a concern of mine also. I guess I'd like a board member, if they would please, to make a motion with regard to the uh, applicant at this point in time. Is there anyone that would like to make a motion? Amy? I move that whereas the, um, the location of the proposed shed is minor enough, the, the change in location in the proposed shed is minor enough that it still can't be viewed from the road or from neighboring properties that uh, the variance be granted as shown in the map. I'll second that motion. I'll third. You'll third it. Okay. We have a first and <laughs> second. <laughs> okay. So we have, I voted yes. And that was John that spoke, correct? No. That was Stephen. Okay, that was Stephen. Sorry, Stephen. So we have uh, John and, and uh, Catherine yet to vote, please. John? Yes. Catherine? I vote yes. Okay, thank you. So the action is approved and it is signed by me. And today's date is March... 10th, 2021. Okay, so I will bring this application to the um, building inspector's office, or to Alana rather, and allow you to move forward. Okay, thank you, thank Keith, you. and thank you, Ms. Brooks. Thank, thank you, you very much for your consideration and um, for your consideration in, in the wait. Very much appreciated. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Have a good night. Okay. Um, next one is the area variance for 12 North Putt Corners Road, of which nothing can uh, further be said or done or needs to be said or done, as that the public hearing is con in continuance, and we will wait to hear from the, can the uh, comments from the County Planning Board. Um, speaking of the county planning board, so am I just going to send them the materials that they submitted for you guys? They haven't submitted anything else. So the reason that I hadn't submitted anything was because we weren't sure if there was anything else that should go to county beyond what they had submitted. And so I just want to confirm with people. I mean, I can also reach out to the applicant and ask them, but I just want to confirm with, with you guys that that's what I'm going to send is what they applied with for the variances. That is correct. Okay. I would verify with them so we don't send a partial. Yeah. Um, partial. Um, do you have contact information for Miss Atlantis? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good enough. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Leonard. Okay. Leonard, if I could just ask Alana, sure. um, how does the county planning board get to see or hear or review what just went on at the first? portion of the public hearing honestly in my experience they don't really care <laughs> well they never they never ask they don't ask for public comment and i have never submitted 
copies of Comet. They've never asked for it. Um, I'm not sure how much of a factor it plays in their discussion. I mean, like, I don't know, is there someone on the town board that acts as a liaison? Because I know that there's like village board members that are supposed to attend those meetings so that if they have questions, a representative from the municipality can act in that way. But I don't know how the town, if the town does the same thing. Stacey might know. Um, I, I do know that Mike Calamano, I believe, still sits on the Elster County Planning Board. Okay. Uh, you know, and he's from Newport. And it is a concern with regard to lighting. I'm sorry? So, who said that? <laughs> who was talking to me? Stacy was talking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Stacy. Mike Calamano still sits, I believe, still sits on the Elster County Planning Board, um, although he's no longer affiliated with the town planning board um is both resident and um is very familiar with the, the application that's before the planning board albeit this is the preferred plan um i, I don't know i just thought i'd throw that out there um Alana, you could always make a call up to them and find out. Yeah, I can just call Robert Leibowitz and ask what he wants and it, or if he thinks that they want it, but. I don't think that the Ulster County Planning Board reviews public comment. They don't, In my, they, they've never asked me for it. It's not my experience that they necessarily factor that in when they're reviewing, um, right. but I can, I can certainly ask him. Yeah. yeah okay. I, cool. I see Amy has her hand up. I have a question. Um, my understanding of the county planning board is that they have a different function. They're, they're there to make sure that a proposed change doesn't affect a county plan for transportation or sewage or something like that in an unfavorable way. But they have different things that they need to review. So the public comments made to us are not relevant to them. Is that correct, Alana and Les? Alana? Yeah, the, that's my you, understanding. If, when, when you speak to them at the county planning board, yeah. as part of an educational process to us, uh -huh. you ask them to list a, uh, list a list of items that they particularly look at with regard to when something comes there for county planning review. Well, they actually do have a list. So they use Dropbox and they have you, they explain, you know, what should go in there and they have okay. application materials. Okay. So it's kind of like, they don't specify, they say application materials, they say the site plan. The public comments are obviously not submitted with the applicant. The public comments come in after the fact. So I think it would still have to be a matter of me asking them okay. if they have a history of receiving them. But again, I, I would be surprised if they say they do. I really don't no. think once, once we ask, we'll know. Okay. Lynn, Lynn and Alana, no. just if I may jump in. Alana, I think the county also has, and forgive me because I'm home and I didn't bring it with me. Yeah. There's kind of a pamphlet that they have that talks about their function and their role and procedures, et cetera. Your yeah, they have like all on their website, they have kind yeah. of the same stuff that we would put on our website about what they do. Um, and it may be helpful the board, you know, there's a lot of information on it online and a primer and a pamphlet in particular about the entire procedure. If you want to take a look at it. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Joe. At, uh, at this point in time, now we have another application in front of us. Application review, Six Spees Road, Mr. James Geyser. Um, would you give us a brief, I have the application in front of me. Everyone has an application, I assume? Yes. yes. Um, could you give a uh, brief synopsis as to what you have to do and to why you are here? Okay. Um, so um, we are interested in building a swimming pool on our property. Um, it's in an area which is invisible uh, from the road or from many of our neighbors. 
if you're familiar with Speed Road, there's a big U-turn as you go up the road. Uh, we are sort of bounded by that U-turn. Um, and um, the, the whole area, there's a big crest of a hill that goes up um, as you uh, go around the U-turn. And our property is right there at the crest of the hill. Um, and the two reasons why it's um, this uh, pool that we're proposing is invisible is because it's in a heavily wooded area, um, which uh, makes it invisible from the road and from the neighbors. Um, the other thing is that uh, the area that we're proposing um, is partially open. We, we've been living in this particular house since 2002 when we moved back. We used to live in New Paltz back in the late 70s and the 80s. Uh, and then we uh, moved away and we moved back in 2002. Uh, and um, the, so it's partially open. There's a picnic table there. Um, the uh, installation of the pool there would require some tree removal uh, at this top of the crest. But in fact, the wind impact um, in fact, it would be invisible from the road. I've included uh, pictures from Google and the supporting documents, uh, which show a um, looking down on it. You can see that it's very heavily wooded. Um, and you also have a view as much as I could from the road looking up into the area where the, uh, where the um, pool is. And that's also, you'll see, is just blocked by uh, trees. Um, the problem that we didn't know we were going to run into uh, is that uh, when uh, an inspector came out to look at it, um, the, the, uh, what, what that inspector noted was because of the U-turn boundary of the property, um, he said that it should be considered as a corner lot. Um, and apparently, um, I, I don't know what the ins and outs of this are, obviously, but apparently you cannot build on a corner lot. Um, if you can build on a corner lot, then maybe there isn't any problem here. But that's what was noted as the problem. Um, so. The, what, the reason why we think variance might be considered uh, is one, it's invisible. It's, uh, the, uh, it's also a unique terrain. Um, our house being situated at the crest of this hill uh, is, uh, puts actually the land in which the pool would go uh, from 10 feet above the road level to uh, more than 70 feet above the road level. So there, and those are all down below. Uh, that's part of the reason very visible. In fact, you wouldn't see the pond trees uh, <coughs> at all because you couldn't see up to it. But in fact, it's totally surrounded by trees. Um, the, um, I, I guess that's, that's really the basis of what we feel. It's, it's kind of a unique situation. It's invisible from our neighbors. Our neighbors are pretty far away in any case, um, uh, like uh, mainly 400, 450 feet. There's one which is way down below, that's maybe 350 feet away, uh, but you, there's no way you can see the uh, building from uh, the lower parts of the road. Uh, there's just a steep hill that's wooded. Um, I think that's, you know, that's the basis of it. We were now retired and we've been interested in having a swimming pool for a very long time. Uh, we're, we're now in the, at least financially, we can afford it. And now we want to see if, if that's possible and permitted by the board. Okay, thank you. Stacy. you have commentary? Um, well, you have my memo. Um, yes, it, I do. It's 
not that you can't build on a corner lot, you just can't have a swimming pool in a front or side yard. Right. And, and that's predominantly because of it being a corner lot, correct? Well, I, the, the, the parcel itself is unique because the, the, there's no corner, there's no two intersecting streets as defined as a corner lot. Okay. So it comes up and around. I, I, I applied that to this particular lot um, because you got, you know, you can only have one front yard, one rear yard, and two side yards. So if you were to take the, the property line that's coincident with the road, you would have a three-sided block. So I applied the corner lot um, definition to this particular lot. In any case, regardless of how I apply, whether it's all a front yard or whether it's a corner lot with a side yard and front yard standards, it would still be required to meet a variance. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess at this point in time, we'll uh, entertain a motion to set a public hearing for our next meeting of April 14th. I have a second on that. I second. Thank you, Catherine. Seconded all those in favor by aye. 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 Okay, uh, motion carried. So the public hearing will be set for our April 14th meeting. And um, Mr. Geyser, um, you will uh, gather from the building department. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll give you a packet as to what, pay, what neighbors you need to notify, a stake needs to go in the ground. And after all of that task has been completed, you'll need to return a affidavit to the building department. At the next meeting, anyone that wishes to speak yay or nay in regard to your project. They can speak, we will discuss it, and um, then we will vote. Okay, That's so- It's not a county road, is it, Stacy? Uh, Speedy's is not a county road, no, um, but okay. he put all that information from Alana in the home department. Planning okay, department. yes, Ms. did you hear that, Mr. Geyser? Uh, could you repeat that? Yes, Alana, from the planning department will get you all of the information that you need with regard to notifying, notifying your neighbors and the processes with which it needs to go through. And will that be emailed to me or? I can email you tomorrow and then I can also call you too, if that helps. That's great. Um, okay. And um, my cell phone is included. That would be the one to use. Okay, I can use that one, it's no problem. And an email is fine too. My email. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We'll see you next month then. Okay. Very okay. Good. Now there's one more item on the agenda that's not on the agenda that needs to be discussed. And I'm hoping that, uh, Joe, you're still there? Yes, Lynn. Um, the draft resolution um, with regard to Rotolo. Correct. How do we proceed with that? Well, I believe at the, at the last meeting, well, the matter was adjourned. There was no public hearing um, opened because notices had not been provided. So the board was unable to open any uh, public hearing on it, but the matter was continued until tonight. That is correct. If there is no public hearing, and let me ask, I, I see something lit up on my screen. Um, is the applicant's agent, Mr. Rotolo, present by phone at this meeting? I am, I am, oh. Mr. Mariello. I've been having a really tough time though hearing you guys. I've been struggling all night listening, but uh, I am here. I don't know how you hear me. Okay. I can hear you fine. Alana, I okay. assume then that notices have not been mailed. They have not been posted. You've not been furnished with any no. affidavits. Am I correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
That, that, that is correct, yes. Then, as in, no, I have not done that for the various reasons that we discussed, namely that um, the legal law notice said that I was asking to operate a single family house in an area where it's not allowed, when in fact there are. Also, my request was to be allowed uh, to be granted a special use permit uh, to operate in a manner which was consistent with the way the uh, Oscar County Board of Health approved and in a manner which I had previously agreed with uh, Mark Chaffee. And this agreement was uh, reached, uh, at least referenced on the record in a court proceeding. So um, for those reasons, uh, I did, and also the fact that the legal notice says, you know, that uh, Angela Rotolo is requesting this one. In fact, it was 139 State Route 208. Uh, all of those uh, issues, um, you know, made the public hearing uh, moot. What also made the public hearing moot was that we uh, are beyond the statute of limitation period as far as uh, the 62 day rule. And um, this question actually came up in connection with another member, with another hearing, uh, whether Anyone can vote, any board member can vote on a, an application that preceded their appointment to the board. And on the 267, uh, Town Law 267, Paragraph 6, the way, it, the, the way it reads is that it doesn't, uh, the board members are not supposed to vote on, on something that preceded uh, Mr. Otolo, let me can I read you something, please. Listen to me carefully, please. Okay. Town Law 267, Subdivision 6, relied upon by the agent, applies only in situations where a town board exercises a local option to increase its zoning board of appeals from three members to five members. Under such circumstances, such additional members were prohibited from taking part in any matter for which an application was on file prior to such additional members' appointment. As members, Donnelly and Gatto are and were at the meeting at which the public hearing was scheduled, members appointed to fill two vacancies on a pre-existing five-member board, the subdivision cited by agents does not apply. So your recollection that they cannot vote is incorrect. Well, um, that, that I'm going by what it says, the plain meaning of the words. Uh, that, that, that's what I'm going by. Okay. But in, in any event, there was also the issues of, uh, of um, uh, the, the fact that the uh, legal notice uh, contained uh, several uh, inaccuracies. And so that, that's why I did not uh, follow through with that. It, we, would have, we would be having, in effect, a, a public hearing on me having requested that I, be oper uh, that I be allowed to operate a multifamily house when my application clearly says I am requesting that I be allowed to operate in a manner consistent with the way the Ulster County Board of Health approved and in a manner of the way it was agreed with the prior building inspector. So that, that, that is what I requested, but that is not what the legal notice said. The Ulster County Board of Health is not the Zoning Board of Appeals. No, but I had, uh, according to Mark Jaffe, if I did that, and, and there is a court transcript on this. Uh, th th we agreed that this is how we would have resolved the issue in the past. And the issue was resolved. And, and then it seems to have uh, come up again. And so uh, that's why I referenced that. I will ask, do all did and do all members of the board, I believe it was either 12 or 14 pages, have they received the memo um, sent to us by Mr. Moriello. Yes. Okay. I did not receive. I did not receive that memo though. That memo was not directed to you. It was member. It was directed to the members of the board. It was not directed to you. Okay. I thought I would be entitled to it as the applicant. That is correct. It was directed to the members of the board 
Um, you asked Lynn, how should the board proceed? In my view, I think my advice would be that <clears throat> given the position of the applicant, there will there's not going to be a properly noticed public hearing that's going to be able to be held in reference to this case. I think the proposed decision that I sent to the board members um, is in order to finally dispose of this application. It considers all of the legal arguments that the applicant has made to the board, I believe. Um, it certainly is not a substitute for the board's deliberation and final determination, but typically in a situation like this, you would, we can go through the um, proposed decision. I realize it's um, kind of lengthy, but each of the provisions really should be discussed and determined by the board before any decision can be or resolution can finally be made. Uh, I, so before while we it may take some time, it should be read and the applicant is present tonight and privileged to hear it. Yes, but before we move any further, further uh, Stephen, you have uh, recused yourself from this? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, can I ask also, uh, um, you keep referring to the applicant. Um, since there isn't an application before us, nothing yeah, but there is. There, there is an application that's still pending. There's no public hearing, but there's an application that needs to be finally determined. Okay, not a completed application. Uh, the application okay. is complete. There's been no public hearing on the application, but it right. is complete. Thank the you. process has and, not and been completed. And the application is for a special use permit. It is not for a use variance. It is not for an area variance. It is for a special use permit that is to be allowed to operate in a manner in a man in a manner as previously permitted to operate. That's what the application is for. The application is a special use permit to op operate a multi-family building in the R1 zone where only single family residents. No, that is not I, I I I have to disagree. That is not the application. That is not the application. It is the application. It is the, the application. application is I, I unless I am missing something. It is that which I wrote, and I submitted. That it's that I have a date stamp copy, and I will read into the record what it is that I'm asking for. This is on the second page. The applicant requests the following, and it's a special use permit, period. In 2016, entered into an agreement with Mark Jaffe, the pursuant to Ulster County Health Department no, approval. No, no, please stop. Read to me that's what application, I wrote. not the agreement, the application submitted to the building department, not the agreement with the building inspector. No, but this is what what I'm reading to you is exactly what you're asking me to read. It's the, the, the zoning board of appeals application town of New Paltz, Angela Rutolo 4139 State Route uh, Route LLC. This is I mean, are we is there something that uh, what I was reading to you is the application. It's the page two paragraph where it says the applicant requests the following relief. Now, Mr. Rotolo, we have read that. We understand what you're what you're saying. Let me point out that if it were a completed application for a permit, you wouldn't just refer to an agreement by Mark Jaffe. You would attach some paperwork. If you and some person you don't identify in writing simply did a handshake I did. I gave you a copy of the court transcript in one of the attachments. The the, the court that. transcript for for uh, February 9th, 2016. We saw that. Okay. So 
that is 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 I mean, if I cannot convince you with a court transcript, then I don't know what else I can do. Well, I think the court. I think the results of the court were pretty much an indication of the resolution that was put forward that was not completed because that's why you went to jail. That is, you, you are you are conflating the 2016, sir, and that matter is under appeal. Okay, 2016, the matter was resolved. Okay, and I received a certificate of occupancy. And, and that is just, I don't know whether you, you folks really know the record. I really don't. And, and, and I would ask you to look at the name of the person that you think went to jail. I really would ask you to do that. But in any event, the, the 2016 application was resolved. Are you, it was telling, resolved. Are, are you telling me you are not the person that went to jail? I am telling you to look at the name of the individual, sir. But this is, we are here to discuss this. Are you the I, I, went to the jail? Do, w sir, do you want to discuss this application? Is that what we, what we are here to discuss? Yes or no? Well, there's not much more discussion to make because you okay. have. All right. Well, then, then, then give me, give me your denial. And, and which, by the way, I maintain. I continue to maintain that, that, that the members that are voting were appointed after the application. I continue to, to, to maintain that that is not a, uh, a quorum because those people are not supposed to vote. Okay. And, and, so uh, I, I'm, made, okay. I'm ready to make a resolution of determination for a denial no, of the special use permit to Angela Rotolo to operate a multi-family home in an R1 single family home district. Do I have a second? And that is, that is not what the application is for. I second. Thank you. Leonard, I think that that ultimately when the board acts on it, I think now the board needs to discuss what is going to go into that final resolution. Um, I think this is a case that's a bit more complicated and involves more legal issues than something that's going to be decided on a simple yay nay vote by the board. And I think it should be supported fully in a record in the event that there are any subsequent judicial proceedings with respect to the board's action. I'd really um, like to see a thorough record in the decisional part and in the final resolution. It should, that's why I submitted the, app, the uh, proposed right. resolution. Would you um, like one of us to read the, uh, your comments? You may. You may, I may, who do you want Amy, to do it? Amy, please read it. Just a minute. I put it down. That's okay. You read it. <laughs> I think as you go through this, since it was, you know, presented to the board by me at the board's request, obviously the board members should ask any questions, have any input, make any changes, make any modifications. That they well, 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 may be. I have a copy of that resolution? No. How come I can't have a copy? No. It's a, it's this, is, advice. this is for the board's deliberations and determination at this time. Well, then I, uh, well, I, I object to, to uh, getting something on the record without even having looked at it. I, 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 as, as it stands, it looks like we're, you folks are voting on something that's vastly different than what my application says. It's about to go on the record. I believe. But you haven't heard it yet, Mr. Rotolo. No, but I heard what you said. The, the, the resolution is for a, to operate a multifamily house in an area where it's only single family. The, the, first listen, of all, it, listen, it, listen, listen to what Amy is going to read, please. Uh, could you read it, Lynn? I'm, I'm having okay. trouble. I've got it. I've got it in front of me. 
Resolution of determination. Now, therefore, the following resolution made by board member Leonard Loza and seconded by board member Amy Donnelly as follows. Resolve that since the use table clearly provides that multifamilies, multifamily dwellings are not uses allowed at all within the zoning district where the applicant's property is, property is located, the Zoning Board of Appeals is without authority under the code to grant the instant application for the issuance of a special use permit. In parentheses, Tobin versus the Building of Zoning Board of Appeals, Second Department, 2002, 295 AD, 2D, 524, 525. The application, including any requested amendments here on two, be the same, thereby is in all respects denied for the following reasons set forth above, and it is further resolved that the board having made its findings and the applications having been dismissed as a matter of law, no further action or proceedings before the board are required, including the conduct of a public hearing. The question of the adoption of the foregrowing resolution was duly put to a vote on roll call, which resulted in the follow in the results as follows. Len, if I may, I think Please. I think you've got to read the entire summary, starting from page one into the record, not just the end. I, I don't mean to prolong this meeting. Uh, I, the, 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 to me, I, that me, was satisfactory. Do and do I have the right? Do I have the right to follow an Article seventy eight following the following that? Mr. There, there Mr. are provisions. Rotolo, there are Mr. provisions in the law, Mr. Rotolo, as I'm sure you are already aware, that anyone aggrieved by a determination of the zoning board of appeals has the ability to seek relief in an Article 78 proceeding commenced in Supreme Court, County of Ulster, State of New York. That's satisfactory. That's satisfactory to me. But I think you really got to read the entire thing. Do you want me to read it? No, I'm going to read it. I'm ready. Okay. Draft resolution slash decision is dated March 10th, 2021. Resolution slash decision. Application for special use permit or of 139 State Route 30, State Route 208 LLC for multi -purple, multiple residential purposes. Application summary. The application received November 18th, 2019 of 139 State Route 208 LLC. Here and after the applicant by its manager partner, Angelo Rotolo, here and after agent, including all requested amendments thereto, seeks the issuance by the Zoning Board of Appeals here and after the ZBA of a special use permit with respect to its above property to obtain permission from the ZBA to operate the premises as a multifamily dwelling pursuant to the precisions of 140-4 of the code of the town of New Paltz, herefore referred to as the code. The Zoning Board of Appeals finds and determines as follows. The application. The application seeks the issuance by the Zoning Board of Appeals, here ZBA or board, of a special use permit with respect to its above property, including the applicant's email request received December 2nd, 2020, seeking to amend such application to obtain permission from the ZBA to operate the premises as a multifamily dwelling pursuant to the precisions of 140-4 of the code of the town of New Paltz, here referred to as the code. Identification of the property. The applicant's property is located in an R1 zoning district, which permits single family residents defined as the town code 140-4 subdivision C as a building containing one dwelling unit, a dwelling unit being defined as a building or portion thereof providing 
complete housekeeping facilities for one family. The multifamily and two family dwellings are specifically not permitted within the zoning district wherein the applicant's property is located, either as of right or by special use permit. For reasons expressed here, a complete copy of the use tables 140-8 permitted uses contained in the town in, in, in the code of the town of New Paltz is attached and, and made a part hereof marked Schedule A. Procedural history. Following the issuance by the town of New Paltz, the, the building department here, the building department in 2016 of an appearance for the unlawful conversion of a single family residence, which at the time was being used to house six college students in six bedrooms within the residential structure. See the minutes of 12.09.20. Letter to Cater Skill Associates, 04-16-2016. The applicant applied for and received from the building department on June 11th, 2016, a building permit application number 1600139 to perform alterations and venerations and renovations at the premises and on June 11, 2018 was issued by the building department a certificate of occupancy for the use of the president's premises as single family, as, as SF single family residence containing six bedrooms and two kitchen. The ad applicant advocates the position that because its application to the Ulster County Board of health contained statements by the agent to the effect that the premise was to be used for student rental 100% building permit application 06-20-2016. The re approval required by the Board of Health that the septic system at the premises could accommodate six bedrooms should be read as authorization for use of the premises for multiple residence use under the local zoning law. Application for special use permit subdivision A request by email, by email received by the Z, please be quiet by email received by the ZBA just prior to the originally scheduled date for the public hearing upon the application on January 13th, 2021, and again at the meeting at which such public hearing was to be com com conducted. The agent raised for the first time since the filing of the application an objection to the effect that the public hearing had not been scheduled within 60 days of the board's receive the application pursuant to town law 274-B subsection 6. The agent also advised that he had not completed the required mailing notices of the hearing date to adjoining owners the posting of signs and the filing of affidavits of compliance as required pursuant to the precisions of the town code 140-150 for several reasons, including that he did not agree with the language of the board's notice of public hearing. Based largely upon the advice of the board's attorney to the effect that under all of the fact and circumstances leading up to the scheduling of the public hearing, the hearing has been timely scheduled and the language of the public notice public hearing was published was sufficient. The board rescheduled the public hearing for its next meeting on February 10th, 2021. At the board's meeting of February 10th, 2021, the agent raised such objections, advised that he had not completed the requiring mail notices of the hearing date to adjoining owners the posting of signs and the filing of affidavits of compliance as required pursuant to the precisions of the town code 140-150 advised that he did not intend to do so in time for the adjourned public hearing date to be held on March 10th, 2021. And claimed that the board's newest members, John Gatto and Amy Donnelly were prohibited from participating at the December 20th meeting of the ZBA by virtue of the town law 267 subjection six, making the vote to set the public hearing on January, 2021 illegal. Findings. 
The Zoning Board of Appeals finds findings. Wait a minute. The Zoning Board of Appeals finds and determines as follows. The public hearing. In this particular case, the passage of time in the setting of the public hearings pursuant to the Town Law 274B, Subdivision 6, following the filing of the applicant's application for the relief requested originally received November 18th, 2019, was due in whole or in part to the following factors and events. Number one, the application indicates on page one thereof that the matter would come before the board at its meeting scheduled for January 14th, 2020. Number two, on January 10th, 2020, the board would advise by email received from the agent's spouse that the agent would be unable to attend the meeting January 10th, 2020, as, a J as the agent has been sent to jail following his conviction after trial in the local justice court for violations of the local zoning law. Number three, on April, 20, on April 2nd, 2020, the agent was advised in an email from the board secretary, Pat Atkins, of the administrative ban upon face-to-face -face public meetings by executive order of Guad Governor Cuomo. The cancellation of the April meeting of the board and the possibility of meeting to be conducted virtually commencing in May 2020. On that same date, the agent advised an email response that he preferred a face-to-face -face meeting. Number four, June 24th, 2020, the agent was advised in an email from Secretary, Secretary Atkins that the July 2020 meeting of the board would be conducted virtually and that she would advise the agent of the possibility for a face-to-face -face meeting of the board for its meeting of August 11th, 2020. On that same date, the agent advised the secretary in an email response that he was in the process of retaining an attorney who would represent him at the hearing and that he would keep the secretary advised. Number five, on August 18th, the agent was advised in an email from the secretary Atkins that meetings of the board would be conducted virtually at least through the end of the year 2020 and provided the agent the anticipated dates of such meetings on September 16th October 13th, November 10th, and December 8th, and asked the agent to advise of his preference. Number six, on September 22nd, 2020, the agent advised the board secretary in an email that he would be willing to participate in a virtual meeting and inquired about the possibilities of a quorum as he was aware that there were two vacancies on the board at the time of the September 20th, 20 meeting. On October 1, 2020, the applicant was advised that the board member Esposito had confirmed that he must recuse himself from the proceedings upon the application. This coupled with two vacancies on the board that no, meant that no quorum of members could be achieved, at least with respect to the particular application until such vacancies could be filled. Number seven, during the months of September, 2020, October 2020 and November 2020, there remained two vacancies on the board, which said vacancies were filled in the time for the December 20th, 20 meeting of the board. At that meeting, the application again regularly came on to be heard, the agent was present, and the matter was set down for a public hearing to be held on January 13th, 2021. The board is advised that the town law provides specific time periods in which the town is required to hold a hearing and decide an application for a special use permit. <clears throat> Neither the town law nor the town's local laws provide for a default approval of a special use permit application in the event the town does not comply with those timely periods. Town law 274-B6, town code 140-55, town code 140-50, matter of Troy, <coughs> uh, matter of Troy Sand and Gravel Company Incorporated versus Nassau. Third Department, 89 AD, 3D, 1178, 1180, 
matter of Kavanaugh versus the Village of Harriman Planning Board, 174 AD 2D 563, 563-564, 537, New York S 2D 856, 1989. Number eight, based on the foregoing, the Zoning Board of Appeals finds and determines that the owing that owing to matters outside its control and until recently with the acquiescence of the applicant's agent, the application duly came onto the board at its meeting of December 13th, 2020. In the absence of any prior objection on the part of the application or its agent prior to the setting of the public hearing at such meeting, the scheduling of the public hearing was timely and in accordance with the provisions of the town law 274B. The relief requested, number nine, the town law 274B provides then in, in its pertinent parts that the special use permit shall mean an authorization of a particular land use, which is permitted in the zoning ordinance or local law subject to requirements in by such zoning ordinance or local law to assure that the proposed use is in harmony with such zoning ordinance or local law that will not adversely affect the neighborhood if such requirements are met. Number 10, town law 274B further provides that the town board may as part of the zoning local law authorize the planning board or such other administrative body that it shall designate to grant special use permits as set forth in such zoning ordinance or local law. Number 11, the applicant's property is located in an R1 zoning district which permits single family residences, multifamily and other multiple residence uses are specifically not permitted within that zone, either as of right or by special use permit, see Schedule A. While the Uster County Board of Health may have issued a permit authorizing, authorizing the use of the septic system at the premises, the applicant has no entitled to a special use permit unless it is demonstrated that the applicant's purpose use of the premises conforms with the standards imposed by the zoning local law. Such a determination of the Board of Health is based upon the design, materials, construction of the septic system, which will accommodate a particular number of bedrooms and is not a substitute for the manner in which a particular premises may be lawfully used pursuant to the local zoning court, local board. Number 13, contrary to the statements made and positions taken by the applicant's agent, town code 140-8, has not been amended to permit multifamily dwellings as use is permitted as of right or R1 zoning districts. In making, in making such assertions, applicant's agent relies upon some claimed shift in the alignment of the columns as he views some version of the use table electronically. No such shift in alignment is evidenced at the official code section included here. Number 14, the board has been advised of such legal principles by letter dated December 7, 2020 of its attorney, Joseph M. Moriello Esquire, a copy of which is provided by email to the applicant prior to the meeting of the board held on December 13, 2021. A copy of such letter dated December 7, 21 is attached hereto and made part hereof and is marked Schedule B. Hearing and compliance with notice requirements. Add number 15, Town Law 267, Subdivision 6, relied upon the agent applies only in situations where town board exercises a local option to increase its zoning board of appeals from three members to five members. Under such circumstances, such additional members are prohibited from taking part in any matter in which an application was on file prior to such additional members appointment. As members Donnelly and Gatto are and were at the meeting at which the public hearing was scheduled, 
members appointed to fill two vacancies on a pre-existing five-member board, the subdivision cited by the agent does not apply. Number 16, prior to and since January 13th, 2021, the applicant's agent has, refail, has failed and refused to undertake and complete the mailing of notices of the hearing date to adjoining owners, the posting of signs, and the filing of affidavits of compliance as required pursuant to the provisions of town code 140-150. And such failure and refusion of the part of the applicant is expected to continue. In the absence, number 17, in the absence or refusal on part of the applicant to undertake and to complete the requirements on this part to be performed, the applicant application ought not to be continued. We move forward to the next section, resolution of determination. Now, therefore, the following resolution was made by board member Leonard Loza and seconded by board member Amy Donnelly as follows. Resolved that since the use table clearly provides that multifamily dwellings are not uses allowed at all within the zoning district where the applicant's property, property is located. The Zoning Board of Appeals is without, uh, is without authority under the code to grant instant application for the issuance of a special use permit. Tobin V. Board of Zoning Appeals, Zoning and Appeals, 2D Apartment 2002-295 AD 2D 524-525. The application, including any requested amendments thereto, B and the same, hereby is in all respects denied for the following reasons set forth above and is further resolved that the board, having made its findings and the application having been dismissed as a matter of law, no further action or proceedings before the board are required including the conduct of a public hearing. The question of the adoption of the foregoing resolution was duly put to a vote on roll call, which resulted in the following. Roll call vote. You want me to do that one? Sure. Okay, Chair Loza? Denied. That would be I then, right? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> uh, Steve Esposito? He's, he's abstaining. Yeah. Then we have John Gatto? Aye. Amy Donnelly? Aye. Catherine Fuller? Aye. So it's four ayes. Carries. The resolution was thereupon duly adopted. So okay. I uh, submit. If I may, I know. No, we're I'm, done. We're done. We're done. I can't get a copy of this. I cannot get a copy of this resolution. Len, if I may. You may. Um, for, for the board and for the uh, Mr. Rotolo as well. Um, Alana, the resolution is adopted, including the attachments. Um, okay. yes. You'll fill in, you know, the members present, the members abstaining, how the vote went, etc. Yep. You're going to file that entire decision okay. in your office and with the town clerk. Okay. Um, please get a date stamped copy from the clerk sure. as to the date of filing after it has been uh, filed with the clerk. By okay. all means, Mr. Rotolo is entitled to a copy. Once it's date stamped? Um, I, and I think he should get the, um, he should get a copy of the date stamped, but he's entitled to have one before. Okay. And uh, when you say attachments, I'm assuming that to those attachments, you will be including Stacy Deladere's email to me saying that yes, they are in fact 
uh, multifamily homes being used and operated in R1. I'm, I'm assuming that that will be part of the attachments. Is that the, correct? The, yes. decision, the decision and the attachments will be filed in the clerk's office in its entirety. But will it include, Stacey Della, uh, when does, you say attachments, everything, everything that I submitted, correct? Having, having drafted it, it does not include what you're referring to. However, I would say to you that you've submitted numerous things and those are all part of the record before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And upon Well, which, then I would, ask, I would ask the board for a reconsideration given that this very important email from Stacey Della there is not, did not go into your decision-making process and it should have. No, I, well, it's it's in the record, Mr. Rotolo. If it wasn't considered, but it's, it's not attached it, to this, it, to this decision. If it wasn't considered, it means that it's prob it's not relevant. Mr. How can Rotolo? it not be relevant, Mr. Rotolo? I'm not going. I'm not going to argue it here. There's a decision. There are attachments. The entire decision will be filed in the clerk's office. Mr. Rotolo will get a copy. Mr. Rotolo, you are free to pursue whatever remedy you care to pursue. Mr. Rotolo, okay. we, have read, we have read Stacey Delared's um, comments. Uh, they're part of the record. Her email to me specifically saying, saying there yes. are, and, and, yes. and you took that into consideration and you still agree with a resolution that says it, the the, there's, it's not allowed. The decision has been made. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank Alana, you. I will, I will bring those out to the town hall tomorrow. Okay. Somewhere around uh, nine o'clock. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably be there around nine tomorrow. If, if not, I'll find someone to give them to. If not, I'll give them to Chris Marks and he'll bring them over to you. Okay. That's fine. All right. I uh, like to entertain a motion to uh, close the meeting. So move. <laughs> what took you so long? <laughs> Oh, all right. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Quick to respond. Good night to all. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye now. Good night. Good night.